Hey there, Dave Politis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our YouTube page. I'm here on the South Fork of the Flathead River. It's about 7 o'clock at night. It's a little dark, but to uh, give you a little different flavor of things, first of all, the river's gin clear. Right behind me, I've got fish jumping. Uh, I got woodpeckers in the background. Mystical here, great. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to address straight up is on my last video, I had a series of people complaining incessantly about the ads and telling me to take them off. Folks, I've never advertised anything on this channel. I don't put the ads on the channel, but I do turn it, the, the content over to a distributing company that has an agreement with YouTube to monetize this. I am not making a lot of money off of this. It barely pays for my travel and et cetera. So the number of ads they're putting on are suspicious to me for a multitude of reasons, but primarily the suspicion comes in because there's so many. Now, a lot of you have put on information on comments on the last YouTube. And I would encourage people to go back and read those comments because there's some good information about how to avoid some of these ads. So read the posts, that's what I would say. Don't get mad at me. And please, let's, let's try to keep this upbeat and positive. I live in a world that's pretty negative. And I want people to know that my personality is positivity. Uh, a number of years ago, I wrote about a case involving, and I've talked about this before, involving David Cook. Uh, David was a rock climbing guide. He disappeared in the Maroon Bells, September 20th, 2016. And my research on Dave, man, it was uplifting. And I'll never, ever forget one of the statements I read that he used in his business. And that is, life is a series of cans, not cannots. I think about that all the time. And I won't dwell in the negativity. I hate it. And if people are incessantly putting on, uh, I can't see, I, this is too crappy of a video, whatever, then move on. Don't make the comment. I'm not going to do anything different. This is just me, folks. And I know it, it, it's not the general consensus, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. 99.9% .9 of all of you are outstanding. And to that point, in my last video, when I asked you to go on and sign that petition for Noah, man, did the crowds come out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I'll give you a little more review here. But... Uh, when you sign those petitions, I hope it instills upon the public in that area in Ireland to come forward and support that family. And truthfully, uh, a representative from the family got a hold of me. I sent him a lengthy email about what I would do if I was them. It's hard not knowing the politics of Ireland like I know the politics here in the US and Canada and meaning about how that world of authority works. I think that in Ireland, it's probably a lot like the US, but that it's different. The number one thing is, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again for all of you. If you have a police chief in your community, that police chief is a politician. And what I mean by that, is that he is appointed, he or she reports to somebody in government, and he or she makes decisions thinking in the back of their mind, what are the repercussions to my position? The difference with a sheriff is they are elected and they don't report to really anybody. Whatever decisions they make are generally what they feel is best and they don't really care what the politicians in the area do think. And the best example of that is when 50 plus 
sheriffs in Colorado came out and said that they weren't going to support the ban on uh, gun magazines, high capacity gun magazines. Sheriffs are free thinkers. Police chiefs are not. And when you have a police chief in a community that comes out and makes statements that don't make sense to you, that's why. They're thinking more about themselves than they are about the victims. And it's more of a survival game. And uh, we saw a little bit of, of that in Seattle recently when a female black police chief absolutely got fed up with what uh, some of her uh, people higher up than her in local government said to her and then lowered her pay and that was enough and she quit. So if you're a young police chief, you're probably going to put up with a lot. If you're older, you have your pension, you probably had enough and you're saying, hey, forget it and leave. Why compromise my ethics over this? And that's some of the reasons. Now, uh, I did a video up in Glacier National, well, not on, in Glacier National Park, but I did talk about uh, a disappearance there named Barry, Barry Tragen disappeared in Kintla Lake. I went up there, I walked around. I couldn't take any footage there because it's against the rules, because you gotta have a special permit, and they aren't giving out permits right now. But uh, his car was found up there. Eventually the search is over, they didn't find anything. Feel sorry for Barry and his family, and uh, I hope they get some answers. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a case that's evolving as we talk. Many of you asked me to comment about cases that just happened. I don't like doing that for a variety of reasons. First of all, at the beginning of many cases, things are evolving. It's hard to tell what's the truth, what's not. And... I don't want to get myself in trouble by making something that's later proven to be not true. But I followed this one case since day one. And that involves a girl named Nora Quarren. And uh, she was physically, mentally disabled, 15 years old, lived in London with her mom, her dad, and her two siblings. And she came to Malaysia to vacation at a resort. And what I pulled, that's her photo, what I pulled was a series of articles from Ireland, the UK, and the US. Now, just to cover the bare necessities, she was 15 years old, but she really wasn't, didn't act that old and really couldn't maneuver that well. She disappeared the morning after her arrival. She was put to bed by her parents in just her underwear. Now, this happened August 4th, 2020. Parents wake up and they see a window broken in the room. And it was never made clear if that window was broken when they arrived or not. So I'm not sure. And the inquest so far hasn't really talked about that. But the parents were insistent that she would never leave, number one. And number two, she couldn't travel very far. She could, she could walk some distance because she was seen walking through the airport the day she arrived. But let me see if some of these things ring true for you. Here's the headline, Thursday, December 27th, in a Malaysian article. Nora Ann Corrin, Inquest. Handler says dog, search dog failed to scan teen scent three times on the first day of the disappearance. The city of Seremban. A police canine handler testified in the coroner's court today, revealing that a German Shepherd search dog had failed to detect the scent of an Irish French teen, nor Ann Corrin, the first day of her disappearance. Negri Sambilian, contingent canine handler, Sergeant Pu Kun San, who was testifying as the fifth witness at the inquest proceedings to determine the cause of Quarren's death, said the search dog failed a total of three times when ordered to do so at the da Dasun, D-U-S-U-N, resort on August 4th. An inquest into her death heard from Superintendent Mohammed Basar about how many times police searched the exact location. At least three times with a dog. Sound familiar? 
We can assume that when the search team was in the area, the missing person obviously was not. That was their opinion. Now, they searched consistently for 10 days, which is a, a pretty good search effort, in my humble opinion, compared now. 500 searchers, multiple canine teams, helicopters, and ground teams. Now, let's remember, the girl was disabled, couldn't travel long distances, was developmentally disabled, so she really wasn't an outdoors person, so she couldn't maneuver her way through a jungle. She had never been there before. Now, on the 10th day, miraculously, they find the body. Now, I'm not making humor about this. It's not funny at all, but that's kind of the way they place it. They state, how many times was the area searched where her body was found? That was the question. Mr. Bazaar said, three times, the fourth day, the fifth day, and the sixth day of the search. We can assume that when the search team was in the area, the missing person must have still been alive and moving. So it is possible that when they were there, the missing person was not there. The search and rescue for the 15-year-old was only partially expanded after surveillance footage taken at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport showed her walking unaided. She could walk unaided. Nora, who had learning difficulties, was first reported missing by her devastated mom and dad on that August date. She vanished from her bedroom at the resort. Deputy Public Prosecutor Mohammed Ahmad asked Superintendent Mohammed how many times had the police searched the exact location where the body was found. He said three times, at least. We can assume that is true. Now, I want, I want you guys to read the headlines here in the Malaysian newspaper. You're reading that correctly, folks. What it says, desperate search, missing Nora Quarren, 15, was taken by a genie, claims Malaysian shaman brought in by cops to crack the case. Important point here. The police bring in this shaman. Do I think I would? Hey, without finding this girl, you're desperate for answers. It's like looking at a psychic. No harm, no foul. And what this person says, two more fish just jumped, what the shaman said is, I'm going to read it to you. Malaysian shamans who have joined cops from Ireland, France, and the UK to search for missing Brit teen Nora Corrin claim she was lured away by a genie. As a desperate search for Nora enters its second week, yeah, they were, they were past a week, video footage shows the medicine men crying and praying in the dense jungle for her safe return. Wearing skull caps while performing ancient rituals, the shaman sat across legged on the jungle floor and covered their eyes. One of the medicine men, shaman Khalid Muhammad, told cops who were video, videoing them pr praying that he believes the girl was lured by a genie. A genie is a supernatural, invisible spirit believed by some to inhabit the earth and influence mankind by appearing in the form of humans or animals. Okay, now, think about this. An invisible spirit. Have we heard this before? Well, in some ways we have. I'll get to that in a second. It concludes, he said the clip and the... He said in the clip that the genie was drawn to the teen because she was special needs and had chosen Nora as a stepchild. Later on, on, Oct on August 14th, another headline, Nora Korn's body must have been dumped after rescuers left the waterfall because she was lying in plain sight in a sleeping pose, volunteers reveal. She was also found partially in the water, completely naked. And unbelievably, one of these articles stated that her feet had no cuts on them. For people who have read my books, I have stated many times that the search and rescue reports often make no mention of the feet of people that are shoeless. Why is that important? 
because the feet tell the journey. If the feet are clean, if there's no cuts, how did that person walk for 10 days through a jungle with bugs and animals and sharp things on the ground? Use your common sense. Doesn't fly. But somebody was paying attention because they realized Nora couldn't have been on her feet for 14 days. Now, the cause of death was something I've never heard before, but they said it was an ulcer and it was starvation. If there were 500 people searching for her in that jungle, constantly calling her name with multiple dog, name, uh, dog teams, how in the heck wasn't she found? Remember, she was disabled. She doesn't think like you and I. The dog should have picked up on that scent. The dog should have found her, period. And if the dogs didn't find her, the people should have found her. I don't buy it. Something highly unusual happened here. And the parents are adamant that she was abducted. Hard to say that she wasn't. And the, the inquest is still continuing. And I think that very, very few other details are going to be revealed that are going to be enlightening. And why do I know that? I've read hundreds of these inquests. And it's almost as though they've gone through the testimony before it goes public. So they know what they're going to say, and they don't want to compromise themselves or their administration. But police, I don't care where in the world they are, they don't want to be embarrassed. And they don't want to say anything that's going to come back to them later. And they don't want to say anything could happen that is outside of their control. Now, obviously, Nora got out of that room at that resort somehow without her brothers or sister or parents hearing when they were all in that same unit. Now, a window was broken, but how did she get out? Did somebody help her out? And if she did get out, then how come the dogs didn't pick up a scent right there because they had the scent from the last place she was seen? It's not like they had a whole force to try to pick up a scent. No, they were right on it. A dog should have picked it up right in her bedroom and followed it right outside if that's where she went. But that's not what happened. A lot of confusing parts to this story. But for people who aren't completely familiar with my work, I'm going to tell you something. And for people who are, then you should know already. But in this case, where she was found, look it up online, there were these giant granite boulders, big ones, round ones, in this small little stream and waterfall. The location she was at was idyllic, gorgeous. So you got water, you got granite boulders, you got canines that can't pick up a scent. It rained while she was gone. She had, she had a disability. I could go on. This is a classic example case. Now, one of the things, when I first started to do this research, is I started to recognize cases from around the world. And then I started to write about them. And in the first couple of books when I wrote about it, the first one was uh, Missing 411 North America and Beyond. I took, a, I took a big rash of complaints. Hey, just focus on the US. Don't worry about Canada and other places. But I continued on. And I think to date, we're up to 11 countries that I've written about. Now, do I think that there's cases from countries I haven't written about? Oh, absolutely. And there could be a language barrier, a reporting barrier. This Malaysian case is one that was brought to the public's attention because it's a UK victim and they've gone to the nth degree to ensure it gets publicity and the case is covered correctly. Without that, probably would never know. So, in, in conclusion, what would I say? 
if I was Nora's family, I'd push it to, the, I'd, I'd keep pushing this. And my guess is, is that this has probably happened in that area of Malaysia before. But maybe it was a peasant child, maybe it was somebody that didn't have the resources that the Korans had, or the political contacts, unfortunately. Now, I want everyone to know that under the description of this video, you're going to see a series of links, as in every description of every video. If you look at the screen right below that, it says description of the video, click on it, and you're going to find all of the links to Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, yeah just lately I've had a whole series of people say they they want to donate to our cause I don't take donations but what I would ask you to do instead of that is buy the books and donate them to a library I've had a whole series of people that uh, have asked their library to carry them and their libraries haven't to date. So there's a lack of books in libraries. I, I personally have donated 400 books over the last several years to libraries, but we, we can never get enough. So if you have a book sitting around, donate it, it'd be appreciated. And uh, if you go to your library, there's interlibrary loans that you can get the books at. So folks, this is exhausting sometimes doing this. I feel that pain for this family. The loss of their daughter and not knowing where she was. And then hearing a story that makes no sense is just baffling. And how many more cases are there just like this or like Noah's case? There's probably hundreds that we just never hear about. So I want you to be an advocate for the family. And if you live in London, I mean, seriously, call the, uh, call the embassy there. Tell them you support them doing everything you can for this family. And uh, there's a Malaysian embassy in London, and they need to hear from you. And lastly, every time I do one of these videos, I realize that I'm very gifted and blessed to have all of you guys as friends. And that doesn't bypass me any day. I realize that. And I appreciate you, appreciate you greatly. Please be patient with the ads. Uh, if you don't like the production quality, I'm sorry. Um, I really, a bald eagle just flew up the valley. That's a blessing right there. Native Americans would say I'm this video was just blessed by his crossing. Wow. Wow. So thanks again. And uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do these more and more. I'm back in town for a while. And uh, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for the support. Please post this story as many places as you can because I, this, is, this one's an important one and people should understand it. And uh, I'll kind of give you a span around. The woods across the river, pretty wild area. And The water is just gin clear. So thanks a lot, folks. You have a great night, and uh, we'll be in touch.